though it's just about thinking about how markets work. I want to demonstrate equilibrium to you. Um, and so each of you um, hopefully has the sheet of paper I left up here in front, uh, at, which is the accounting sheet. If you didn't get it, it just came in. Don't worry, you picked this up here at the start of the game. The accounting sheet is designed for you to keep track of all of your transactions during the experiment. Um, and so to keep everything honest and uh, upfront, you've got to, whenever you find somebody to trade with, you've got to record uh, who they were, what their Penn State uh, email address is, and what it was that you traded to them, uh, and what it was that you got back from them in return. Um, and that will allow us to go back through this uh, activity and validate all the various trades that are made. Um, so we'll be doing that when we actually go through and grade this. A couple things about the experiment. It's really an experiment in market structures. It's about equilibrium process, but not necessarily equilibrium. That's your hint. A um, couple things about what happens when the market opens. You can proceed with trading, which means you can trade with anybody in this room. Um, you each will be assigned a unique identifier on a small slip of paper that you don't yet have. That unique identifier will give you some information about what it is that you have brought to the market, the items you have to trade, and the items you need to get from somebody else. Your goal in this activity is to transfer what you have into what you need. And the more successful you are at doing that, the more participation points you'll earn during the exercise. Um, you'll have 15 minutes. So how might you use your 15 minutes? Here's a suggestion from me, although you're free to ignore this um, and pursue your own strategy. Um, you can turn to the person on your left or the right. You can turn to the person behind you or in front of you. And you can try to strike a quick deal. That's OK. I, I get why you might want to turn to your friend first um, to try to figure out a way to get a deal done. But bear in mind the following. Your friend at that point, if it's early in the 15 minutes, probably doesn't know anything more about the marketplace than you know. And it's almost like you're trading blind. So my encouragement when you play the game is to spend roughly the first five minutes getting up out of your seat, walking around the room, meeting a lot of people, and just asking lots of questions like, hey, I think I might need this. Do you have any of that? Um, what, how much would you charge for that? And finding out as much information as you can, because information is the key to markets working well. Then when you're armed with that information after the first five minutes, you try to find somebody um, who you think you can strike a deal with. Um, and uh, you do this for the remainder of the time, trying to get what you need. A couple of things I've experienced in this game uh, from the past, I just need to caution you about before I kind of open this up to you. Here are the first, here are the two things that uh, can happen in this game. <laughs> Somehow people think that it's okay to renege on various agreements and then people get upset uh, and they end up shouting at each other. If it gets to that point where I'm worried about physical violence being used, uh, I'll have to put you in timeout for a while while the game continues on. So, so don't go there. It's not worth it. It's just a game in an economic class. Second thing is it's just a game. So you don't need to trade fractional units of anything. I know you're trying to get just ever the smallest edge in a negotiation. So you're thinking, hey, I'll trade you half a chicken. Well, no one here wants a half a chicken. I can just tell you that right now. Keep it all in whole units. And in fact, that's the other thing that goes on with this uh, activity. Let's say it says you need to get 100 chickens to fulfill the category, one of the six categories you need. OK, great. Suppose you get to 90 chickens instead of 100. You're not getting 90% of the points available for that category. You only get the points for that category if you get whatever it is you need. You need 100, you get 100, and you get the full points. If you got 120 chickens, you'd still get the full points for that category. Right? So if you end up with extras, fine. You could use those to trade for something else end up just a little bit short, and you ended up just a little bit short in every category you were looking for, you wouldn't have any profit, in this case participation points, to show for all of your efforts. So, so if you can see, as time is running out, that, you know, hey, I've made this category, but I'm short in these couple, maybe you want to consolidate and try to combine your resources to go ahead and make sure you get to the number in a certain category. That's the way the game um, actually unfolds. Okay, a couple other things here, I guess, you need to know. Um, just for being here and participating, you're guaranteed $3,000 in participation points. And for each of the six categories, again, you get to your number, you'll pick up an additional $1,000 in participation points. So the more categories you can get, the better. That would be the basic uh, rule of life in economics, trying to, to get more as opposed to less. 
What do you guys know about buying and selling? Should you buy low or sell high? Both, okay. So that's the tension, right? The tension here is you're both a buyer and a seller, and you've got certain stuff you can use to get what you need. You're going to have to think about how to get there the most effectively. That's what's interesting. That's what's important. I'm going to open the market up here, and you guys are all missing one crucial piece of information. In this box, I didn't want to pass it out before class, because I knew you guys would all start trading even before the market opened. So in this box, there are a bunch of sheets of paper. You want to get one little slip of paper, and I'm going to open up the marketplace. You have exactly 15 minutes to get going in this game. Good luck. You know, we're all doing the same thing. <laughs> we really do. I need some paper. Where are you at? Alligator. Alligator, go. We got tigers. Do you need tigers? I need sixty tigers. I have hard marks and alligators. I need some seals. I have mad hard for so I gotta get rid of my hard for uh, I just traded a walrus for uh, five walruses for 360 tigers. Uh, Less than one minute. Were you guys successful? Hell yes. <laughs> Okay, that was great guys, I appreciate it. So at the very bottom of your uh, equilibrium experiment sheet, there's a spot where you can note how many of the uh, animals you were able to completely satisfy. So let's say you got four, we put in four here. Four times a thousand, four thousand, plus the three thousand per plan, that would be seven thousand. You only got two categories, then you'll make five thousand. Um, hopefully you guys did well. Let's uh, start here uh, by getting a general show of hands to uh, how many people got uh, different animal groups. Who here got all six animal groups they need to get? That's, that is very, very well done. How about five? Nice job right there. Well done. Four. Very solid job. Very solid. Three. That's okay. Two, yeah, and one or less. Okay, so you can see the distribution, and many of you are probably thinking before we played the game, well, okay, it's just a matter of me finding enough people, making the connections I need to make, um, and then I'll be able to get all the different animal groups that I need. It, the game is not set up that way. The game is set up so that part of the market is roughly in equilibrium, and then parts of the market are in disequilibrium. Let me show you why I suggested that you would want to wait. These were the animals that were hard to find. These were the animals that you had a fair shot at, and these were the animals that were pretty easy. Let me uh, say that each of the different months of the year, there were 12 different months, 12 different roles in this class, each of those is set up in such a way that on the list of animals that you had to trade, you had two animals to trade that were very valuable, two that were basically in equilibrium, and two that were oversupplied. So the sooner you could figure out which of the animals you had that were really hard to find, the lions, the tigers, the bears, and the monkeys, the sooner you're going to be able to figure out that you could basically leverage that information and drive a harder bargain. If you just let some of the numbers overwhelm you, for instance, aardvarks, there were a lot of aardvarks in this game. Um, and the sheer number of aardvarks was way, uh, way greater than anybody in this classroom actually uh, would have been able to sell. So many of you got stuck with extra aardvarks. Well, that's fine, because they were easy to get. Um, Nobody who was searching for aardvarks should have struggled to get aardvarks, for instance. But a lot of you would have gotten shut out looking for lions, tigers, bears, and monkeys. That's the way markets work. Markets don't just arrive at the equilibrium point and happen magically. There's information that's conveyed in markets. Um, and you have to figure out what information is uh, that's good. If you had, so let's start here. If you had lions, tigers, bears, or monkeys, and suddenly they were gone, 
What would you do the next time you came to the marketplace? Would you bring more of those or less of those? Four, right? Because they were pretty valuable. What about the number of people at Aardvark's Buffalo Steak and Gator? Are you going to bring more of those next time or less? Less, right? So the way we say that markets find the equilibrium is markets gather information about what's highly valued, in this case the things that are hard to find, the demand is greater than the supply, and markets also gather information where the supply is greater than the demand, and therefore individuals who wish to sell these items adjust how much they bring to the marketplace. That's the equilibrium process, and it's messy. Right? It's not easy to know what's going on, and it's very difficult in this type of game to figure out what price you should be charging, because nothing is expressed the way you'd expect it to be expressed. It's all done through bargaining, which means that each and every time you see somebody else, you have to figure out whether they've got what you want, you've got what they want, and then once you've figured out there's a possible match there, you have to agree upon the terms of exchange. And you have to do so in a really weird way. Like, for instance, I'll trade you 50 wolves for 200 monkeys, right? Well, you know, that's the price of a wolf in terms of a monkey, right? There's a ratio there based on the overall game dynamic. How many monkeys are in the game? How many wolves are in the game? There's a relative price. But just because you might learn the price between monkeys and wolves doesn't mean that you could have the same price between camels and buffaloes. There's a different price, right? Everything is in terms of one other animal. How do we normally solve this in economics? Well, the answer is what we do is we establish a currency where everybody understands what the price is. If I had given you some cash, pretty soon after a while in this game, there would have been different prices for different animal groups, and they would have all been expressed in terms of the same currency, and you would have gotten a sense of how much you were willing to pay for the different animal groups. But because it's all done through barter, it's all about learning all of these different ratios. That's what makes barter so difficult in a room of you know, 200, uh, and that's why we resort to currency as a way of solving that problem. Let me take you to the document camera. We'll just look at this briefly. A couple of key points I want to make here. The first is, for you to succeed in this game, you had to recognize that there needed to be a double coincidence of wants. What is that? In a barter environment, I've got what you want, you've got what I want. Trade didn't happen if you were saying, Hey, do you have snakes? And the person went, I don't have any snakes. You just walked on, right? No double coincidence of ones. Right? So you had to, each person had to have what the other person wanted. That's a crucial idea in barter. This is the idea again that both parties, both sides have what the other wants. That's a characteristic of a barter economy. And that's not a characteristic of an economy based on currency. In a currency-based economy, what we do is instead of having to worry about these kind of very explicit costs, monkeys in terms of camels and the like, we do something different. So in this game right here, it could be you and you could have a friend. And so what you needed was you needed to have what they want, they needed to have what you want, boom, the trade was done, and everybody was happy. We could put currency in the middle of a barter economy. Let me show you what happens. All right? You got to get currency. Then you take the currency over to your friend, and your friend says, "Fine, I'll do the deal." Right? The friend has to get currency. Then they take the currency over to you. If I put currency in the middle of an arrangement between two people, it just complicates things, right? That's just an added step. Currency is not efficient between two people, but currency is very efficient if we make the size of the market a little bit bigger. Let me show you. So let's say we've got a market here where there's eight individuals and you have to go through a barter exchange process. So here you are right here. What are you going to have to do? Well, you have to find out what this person has and this person has and this person has and this person. You have to go ahead and do what? Make all of those connections, right? See what they've got and see if there's a double coincidence of one. This person's going to do the same thing. They're going to have to find out what all these people want. This person's going to have to find out what everybody wants. This person's going to have to find out what everybody wants. This person's going to have to find out what everybody wants. And this person's going to have to find out what everybody wants. In other words, this is this giant mass of communication, right? That's just with how many people? With eight, right? And we had a huge problem here because it's way more than eight. 
That's a lot of different pieces of information you've got to get. Suppose I put currency in the middle of a market where there are eight traders. There it is right there. I don't have to worry about double coincidence of once. I just have to get some currency, and then I can give that currency to this person over here. doesn't matter if they have exactly what they want. As long as they want to take my currency, I'm good to go. Everybody, in fact, just has to worry about converting what they've got into currency, and all prices get expressed in terms of that currency, and the, of the, the ease in which you can exchange it is a lot easier. So that's one crucial thing that you can think about with markets, is how are they organized? Well, currency comes to exist because they make it easier for people to trade. And of course, the idea with, with any sort of economy is you want to try to create an environment where people can exchange goods and get more of what they want. Uh, and that's the beauty of this process right here.